Jeff, when we talk about ministering to adult children, we have to begin probably by recognizing that adult children are not children children. And, and so what are some of the key differences between ministering to your children when they're under your roof and your children now that they're grown and gone? Well, they're just basically different guidelines. And there are, you know, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's older, and I think that, in, in, not maybe not explicitly, but implicitly, is that when he lives, leaves your roof mm-hmm. at some point in the future, there's a line of demarcation as it relates to marriage. There's the leave and cleave principle. Mm-hmm. So if there's a leave and cleave to someone else, and there was a cleaving under your tutelage or under your parentage, right? right. So there was a... Again, implicit, maybe not explicit, but implicit within that uh, is this idea that your children are cleaving to you when they're under your roof. Now, sometimes we violate that, and that's why uh, a child abuse is such an egregious sin is because a child who, in their innocence, are forced out of this place they're put to cleave to you and you violate that, then there's a real atrocity that's committed. Uh, but when they leave you and then cleave to their spouse, there's something that's really changed in the dynamic. And I find that oftentimes, and these are where the mother-in-law jokes come, I think, a lot of the times, that sometimes mothers are incapable of recognizing there's a radically different relationship now, and they try to take their same mothering skills and apply it to their spouse or their ch- child who's now married, and they're crossing a line that may be not as visible to some as it should be, and therefore the, 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 your child's spouse becomes frustrated in right. your you know, getting into their world. And so I think just a clear recognition that once your child leaves your house and is no longer quote unquote on the payroll, um, that there's a different dynamic that happens. And if you don't recognize that, then you'll be like the Charlie Brown teacher. Wah, 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 wah. You'll be talking and they won't have any idea what you're saying because they're already thinking differently. They're responsible for different things. And I think in the spiritual realm, there's a difference too. There'll always be your child. There's no question about that. And there'll always be a difference in that relationship than say just a friend. But it's not as it was when they were under your roof. And uh, that's an important thing to uh, take into consideration when you're having that interaction with them. Yeah, they're, they're different people. And, uh, and sometimes I think we've talked a lot about this um, in working on the book and some of these ideas that sometimes the best guideline is, how do I treat my friends? If, if my children are adults now, then I, I, am I treating them far differently than I would treat my friends because it's not going to take very long for them to pick up a difference. Wow, you treat your buddy over at the club or in, your colleague at work in this really respectful you know, way and, and I'm doing all right with my life and you're still treating me like I'm knee high, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that, that makes sense to me. You know, when I think about the big picture, when I think about, okay, what is my child looking at to me? What, what is my child looking at me for? What, how do they see me? How do they view me? They've got to see a marked difference in your character. They have to see, it's very simple, they have to see Jesus in you. Mm-hmm. And they see the way you treat your friends, they see the way you treat a casual acquaintance, and that they, they may see the way you then treat them or take liberties in the offering of advice. If you have a friend, you're reluctant sometimes to offer advice unless it's warranted. Right. And yet you feel like there's this free flow of advice coming from your parents that may not even be wanted or, or, or they feel it's not needed or it's not warranted. And so I think we have to be real cautious about, I'm free with my six and 11 year old to offer advice every day. I mean, it's part of my instructions as a parent. Once they leave, I have to be able to reconsider, okay, now where do I speak and where do I hold back? And that takes a spirit led um, kind of a guidance, but it is different. It is radically different. Well, I think one of the lines there is, you know, when my child is six years old or eight years old or 10 years old, I know a vast percentage of their world. That's a good point. And the older they get, the really the less I know of their world. And so when I, a lot of times, this is a mistake I know I've made, um, is that 
my advice is assumptive. I am assuming that I know far more than I may know about yes. the situation. And that's a difference. When I'm talking to a friend, advice is very conversational. It's not you know, pontificating. I'm trying to find out what are all of the variables here? What, it, right. what really are they dealing with before I offer any sort of advice? And, and that would be a, a good, simple guideline with our adult children. Try to be increasingly conversational. Make sure that you understand as much about what they're going through as possible before you kick into that mode of, gosh, and it's a great mode. I really love you and I really want to help you. Right. But and help that, that comes too soon is not really help and it gets pushed away. And be more reluctant to offer advice and do as Jesus did even with, I mean, here's the creator of the universe in human flesh. If anybody was going to be able to rightfully give advice, <laughs> it would have been Jesus for those 33 and a half years that he was on the planet. Mm -hmm. And yet often you'll watch in dialogue that he had with others, the respect of their imago Dei, the fact that they were created in the image of God. He'll respect them by not just merely, here's the advice, but also ask questions. And it's a very simple practice, but you would be amazed at, to ask a question, and then when they give maybe an answer that you disagree with, not respond to it. Just ask a question, which leaves them with, well, I wonder what he thinks or she thinks. And so there's some just fundamental, uh, easy strategies that you can use that don't, like you said, you're not assumptive that you know everything ask questions, leave them with a question and feel comfortable that, by the way, you do have an ally in this. You have the Holy Spirit. And as you pray and release the Holy Spirit into their lives for specific supernatural encounters they're gonna have or when they're um, lying in bed at night and looking up at the ceiling and the Holy Spirit is there, you can't be there. The Holy Spirit's much more capable and discerning to be mm -hmm. able to put questions or make people uncomfortable because that's exactly what Jesus said. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he's going to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. So the Holy Spirit is your greatest ally. And it, and yet when we don't have faith enough that God's oper operating through his Holy Spirit, and that's why I say the oxygen on you first, if you're not conscious that the Holy Spirit is there working and doing the lion's share, 99.9% .9 of the work in your child's life anyway, and that you actually play a somewhat small role, though it may be a relatively important role relative to other human beings, but you play a smaller role and it's much more incumbent upon the Holy Spirit to do that in your child's life. You'll feel much less this overpowering sense that you have to direct, that you have to offer the advice, that you have to set straight, and plus they're gonna be looking to your life and how you live it. Um, uh, as much as they're going to be listening to your words. And I think I've said, uh, we've talked about this before, but a good friend of mine, David Gossett, who uh, was a U.S. amateur champion and won on the tour and, and a very good friend of mine, he, I always remember when he used to tell me about his mother, says, David, uh, I can't hear what you're saying because your actions are speaking too loudly. And I always remember that, and he, he remembered that as well from his childhood. So uh, our actions do speak much louder than our words. Uh,